Good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Rinks, and I'm a member of the Marin Healthcare District Board. We do a series of educational forums on different topics of interest to the Marin community, and tonight I'm excited to present a forum on pediatric vaccination. We have three wonderful panelists. Our first panelist is going to be Lisa Santora, who is the Deputy Public Health Officer for Marin County. In this position, Dr. Santora provides clinical oversight for public health emergency preparedness, communicable disease prevention and control, and detention health. Prior to this role, she was Chief Medical Officer for the Beach Cities Healthcare District. Uh, Dr. Santora has worked in federally qualified health centers across the country. She's a graduate from Rutgers New Jersey Medical School and completed residencies in preventive medicine and family medicine in Buffalo and Miami. After Dr. Santora, we have Kathy Taylor, who is president of the Ouchless ER Project, a nonprofit here in Marin County. Uh, Kathy has worked at the University of San Francisco for the last 20 years performing ultrasound. In 2015, Kathy approached the Marin Healthcare District Board and Marin Health Administration with an idea to improve the experience of sick or injured children in the emergency department. Since then, many improvements and programs have evolved throughout the county. Now Marin is, for the first time um, now in Marin, from the time a child enters the emergency system until discharge, from the hospital, they have care designed to meet their very unique needs. And then finally, we have Chandra Taylor, who is a child life specialist for Marin Health, where she's worked since January of this year. Chandra has been practicing as a child life specialist for over five years and brings knowledge and expertise in child development and supporting children during their medical experiences. So with that, I'd like to welcome all our panelists and we're gonna turn it over to Dr. Santora to begin. Thank you very much for having me here today. I am presenting before we have a lot of uh, information around the pediatric vaccine, and we're going to give you the most up-to-date information we have, but I'm very excited to be here with the panelists because I think with pediatric vaccinations, it's just so important for families to make informed choices uh, for their children and their families and to be prepared with the tips that you're going to hear later on in this pre presentation if you choose to have vaccination for your children to make it as easy as possible. It's a very challenging population. The younger our children are at vaccination, it becomes more challenging for many reasons. Um, I'm a mom and I just remember some of the fears I had when I first vaccinated my, my babies and they received their infant vaccines. They're not infants anymore. They're now 10 and 12, but I still remember that day. And I know that um, it can be a frightening day, not only for the children, but for parents as they see their children react to getting a shot, which is not an exciting day for, I think, any of us on this call today. So I'm gonna jump ahead. We're gonna go pretty quickly, but we'll have plenty of time for um, questions and answers. Um, and I just wanted to provide you an update to see where we're at. Um, you're hearing a lot of news around increases in COVID-19 activity across the country, and that's to be expected. Um, there's starting to be some, some trends that we do see with COVID. Um, there's a lot of unknowns. We were um, we know there's going to be variants that emerge. We didn't know Omicron was going to be as big as it was. It was our largest wave, um, but we knew spring break was coming, and that's a time where people are traveling and relaxing in their protective behaviors. So we're not surprised to see that kind of uptick in cases in our community, and it's really driven by the BA2 variant. So Omicron first came as BA1, and it quickly um, transformed to a BA2 variant, which is now more, almost 100% of the sequencing that we're completing in the county is of a, a new version of that, a mutated version. And that's the other known known about this, about this virus is that it mutates. That's what viruses are designed to do. And it really depends on the vaccination levels in a community to determine the risk for mutations, um, like we saw with Omicron, which is a highly mutated variant um, versus um, descendants of, of the original alpha, which were less mutated. And our concern around mutations is when, as the more mutations there are, the less of a match that there'll be with the vaccines that are available. So you'll hear a lot more information coming forward as, uh, as pharmaceutical companies are developing vaccines to make a better match um, as this vaccine, as this virus um, transforms, which is again, what it's designed to do. Um, I just thought this data would be really interesting to show. We, all, we look in our community 
on trends. And this is just a glimpse of the peak of the Omicron wave, really looking at the age groups that affected most. It wasn't surprising for us to see that 12 to 18 year old age group to have um, the highest case rates in beginning at the Omicron surge. It was driven by two things. One, they had waning immunity. This is at the point that Omicron hit. Most of our adolescents were vaccinated in May to June. So they had significantly waning immunity. They were a group that had lower booster rates just because I think as we've seen with Omicron um, and, and I think most researchers and clinicians will advise is that we don't see such severe disease in our youngest populations, unlike the flu. And so it, it is a different disease. And so we saw many families opt not to get boosted, even though it was time to um, get a booster shot for that 12 to 18 year old population. And then just the behaviors. Our, our adolescents are social um, creatures. Actually, everyone between um, 12 and 35, year old, 35 years old are our most social creatures. So we'll often see uh, changes in, in the rates of disease based on different seasons of the year and the activities that they're engaged in. And then you'll see the zero to four population is kind of second. And that's a population we look at because it's an unvaccinated population. It's uh, We don't have an approved vaccine for that age group for six months to five years to four years old. So it's five to it's five and above who can be vaccinated. So it wasn't surprising for us to see that. And then we also have um, our five to 11 year olds um, had, had, the, um, had the third highest rank. Um, and that wasn't surprising either because although we've been very successful in Marin, I think we have the, still have the highest rate of vaccination in the five to 11 year old group. It does not match the vaccination rates in our adult group, which is our highest um, group. We have over 90% of our population vaccinated. And then this is just a closer look where you can look at the past month and you can see how things have changed as things have settled down. We had, um, we had a lot more Omicron surging in our community. And so we um, had some individuals develop what, what is now known as hybrid immunity. So they have both natural and acquired immunity from the vaccine. And you see now the zero to four population is um, of, the, of our to all of our population now has the highest case rate and that's our unvaccinated population. And so you can see the 12 to 18 year olds really have gone down. I think that really reflects probably a lot more natural um, immunity. We saw a lot of spread of Omicron in that group. Then we also saw a large group once we saw how contagious Omicron was, we saw a huge surge in the boosters among the 12 to 18 year old population. So this is just the final snapshot of where we are in our community. Um, and this has been challenging I think for many is that we have two new benchmarks for how we're performing in our, as a, as a county in the nation. And so the CDC changed its metrics, which is a good thing because we really have learned a lot about this disease and we really wanna limit public policies because there really is a fine balance between the freedoms we get to experience and the risk of the disease. And we need to relax when we can relax, when we don't see such severe disease um, causing hospitalizations or deaths in our community. And that uptick that you saw was, like I said, was not unexpected. Even though we are considered one of the low counties in the county check, um, and that's because of, of the shift in the CDC metrics, we still have substantial transmission, high transmission, not even substantial high transmission of COVID-19 in our community right now. The good news though, is because of our high vaccination rates, we have a great disconnect. We might have high transmission of disease, but we have low hospitalization rates. And we also have low um, deaths in our community currently because the Omicron variant, although much more contagious, is not as severe, so it's not as virulent and doesn't cause as severe disease. That being said, of, the, of all the hospitalizations ever in Marin County, more than 20% happened during this last Omicron wave. And a lot of people were surprised by that, didn't surprise us in public health, because when you have so much disease and so much um, virus being transmitted in the community, even though your hospitalization rates are low, the absolute number of people being hospitalized will be higher. And so that's not surprising to us, but I know the, the community was very concerned when they started seeing increases in hospitalization rates. And this is what I referred to um, earlier is hybrid immunity. So what we're seeing, and this has been frustrating for many people, is that um, because of the high level of mutations in that spike protein, that's it, exactly where the va vaccine that, mo that all of us received was targeted towards. There's a lot of mutations in in the Omicron um, variant at that spike protein. So we saw the, the virus learn how to evade the vaccine. Um, that being said, many people who were boosted and or fully vaccinated were infected. They were infected at much lower rates during the Omicron surge, but they were still infected. So I think that became one of the stories that we heard in the community is what, you know, why should I even get boosted 
um, because there's breakthrough cases. And yes, there were breakthrough cases, but what we have consistently seen is that these vaccines remain effective in preventing hospitalizations and deaths. And so we see why gaps in the rates of hospitalizations and deaths um, between those who are vaccinated and unvaccinated and around a 40% reduction in hospitalizations and also in, in infection in between those who are boosted and unboosted. And that's why, again, as we learn more about the disease, we probably will be more narrowing the recommendation of who should get boosted. And you saw that in this last version of the second booster, uh, the recommendation from Marin County Public Health is really the second booster is for those over 65 years old with severe illness that puts them at higher risk for poor or adverse outcomes from COVID-19 infection. So people who have moderate to severe immunocompromising con conditions like stem cell transplants or an active cancer treatment, or those with chronic conditions that we know and have seen consistently in our county place them at higher risk for a poor outcome. That's individuals with diabetes, liver disease, and kidney disease. And so what you hear me talking about is that it's a very different population than our pediatric and adolescent population where we're not seeing significant, um, significant levels of hospitalizations or adverse outcomes in this a younger population. That being said, um, during the Omicron wave, just like I described in our community, it was, um, we did see an increase in the hospitalizations among children zero to four years old, um, or six months is the, the, the age that we're looking at for vaccinations. And it was higher than um, the hospitalizations, the absolute number of hospitalizations were higher during the Omicron surge than during the previous Delta surge. And again, that's not surprising. That's because just so many more people were infected. So individuals who might have been at a higher risk or a poor outcome, even in the pediatric population, um, because of a high risk of exposure to COVID-19, there is, again, again, a greater chance for them being hospitalized. But it was important to note that and when they looked at studies from hospitalizations for Omicron, the majority of children under the age of five who were hospitalized did not have um, another underlying condition. So um, yes, um, having an underlying um, chronic condition, some of our children are also sick and managing um, chronic illnesses or immunocompromised states that, that definitely places them at a higher risk for an adverse outcome from COVID-19 infection. But we did see that um, the majority of the children that were hospitalized during the Omicron wave did not have a, a, a comorbidity. Interestingly, we did see a lot of um, co-infections. So in the children that were infected with both RSV and COVID-19, that's what resulted in, in their hospitalization. So that was um, an important note. Um, that being said, if you look and compare Delta and Omicron, the, there were very different risks. Delta was a much more virulent Variant, So it caused more severe disease than Omicron. And you can see at every metric from ED visits to intensive care you, you, that the risk for um, a poor outcome in the pediatric population and children younger than five years old was significantly less than in Omicron when it was compared to Delta. And so this is the latest update we have on the vaccines. And so I appreciate the frustration um, in that's being experienced by the community as it tries to understand our national um, processes for approving vaccines. It's frustrating as a public health official because they're not consistently followed, very set approval um, pathways. And so that being said, we were all expecting Pfizer to be approved just like it was approved um, previously for the five and above population. We were expecting that to happen. And then they pulled back their submission because they recognized that they weren't seeing the outcomes that they were hoping to see in their clinical trials. And what you have already heard is that they are planning to submit, resubmit their application for emergency use authorization with a three dose regimen. I think it's really important to note that one of the differences between Pfizer and Moderna since the beginning in all great age groups has been the dosage of the vaccine. And if you look at the Moderna um, submission in their update, the under six years old are gonna be receiving a 25 microgram two dose regimen. And that's compared to the Pfizer three microgram three dose regimen. So what is frustrating for us right now is that the Moderna vaccine has been approved, the pediatric vaccine has been approved for use in the EU, in Canada, and in, in Australia. And they, we have not seen the same approval in the United States. They've been slow 
from, uh, I'd say the, the FDA has been dragging its feet in moving forward with the Moderna approval for the pediatric population, even though at this point there's millions of children that have received Moderna across the globe, um, there's a delay in the United States. So that creates, um, I think for, for, for a nation that's been polarized and politicized, when there's that inconsistency in information sharing and inconsistency in process, that creates um, distrust in, in a vaccine process, which especially in the pediatric vaccine world is even more concerning because parents are trying to make the best informed choice around vaccine. And when the government is not consistent, that creates an environment of distrust. So we remain committed to following the processes and communicating and using forums like this to share the information that we have and then keeping the Marin County population up to date so they can make informed choices around their vaccinations. So we are expecting Moderna to gain approval. That being said, we are now not expecting approval until June. They have not placed an, um, a calendar date for the Moderna EUA yet. That's the emergency use authorization on the FDA. And the only calendar date that is currently posted for consideration of pediatric COVID-19 vaccines is the ACIP, which is the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices for the Centers for Disease Control, which is in June. And so that is when it was uh, indicated that the Pfizer EUA and the completion of its clinical trials would be ready. So that being said, we, that's our tea leaf reading. Uh, I have been proven wrong with my tea leaf reading. The FDA could accelerate um, without us knowing, uh, and the CDC could do the same. Um, approval of the Moderna, um, not yet the Pfizer, because the Pfizer hasn't completed its trial, but that's um, to be seen. We also know that Moderna has already um, prepared studies to submit for also getting booster approvals. Um, my kids, like many other elementary school kids, are approaching the time where they would be eligible for a booster. And so that's for us, I think, again, that becomes as a parent making an informed choice of whether do you boost your child um, with the information that you have based on the clinical research that's available or not? And that's something that we still just don't have the information yet. We saw with the adolescent population, there was benefits of boosting. And that was during, uh, I think it's important to note some of the benefits of boosting was because we were living with policies that isolated and had quarantine. And uh, for an adolescent attending school to be placed on quarantine was a very significant um, impact of having a positive um, COVID test or COVID exposure. And so what we're seeing now as um, more vaccines are becoming available that we're seeing changes in the policies. So I think that's where we'll be evaluating the, again, what are the benefits of boosters? What are the risks of boosters? Um, and having parents have the information make the best informed decision for their families. And I think this is also really important. Um, the California came out, the governor came out in October of last year um, announcing that we're the first in nation that was going to require um, pediatric vaccines um, for attendance in school. They have shifted their uh, tone a bit. Um, they um, just released a statement at the end of last week and said, um, reinforcing that they were not going to require a vaccine for schools until it was a fully approved vaccine. Um, and just reinforcing that it's a precondition, a precondition to rulemaking for back school COVID-19 vaccine requirements. And um, they clearly stated uh, last week that they would not um, issue a vaccine requirement until no earlier than July, 2023. So that's a big shift in their position from October, 2022. And then they closed out their statement that even if they have full approval, and this is heartening for me to see, this increases my confidence in our, in our public health authorities at the state level, is even if there is FDA approval, they're gonna be looking to not only the ACIP and CDC, but also the American Academy of Family Physicians and Academy of Pediatricians to make an informed consensus-based choice on whether they would even require COVID-19 vaccine. And I think that's really important just because we need more time to see how this pandemic is going to evolve into an endemic state. And also to really look towards a consensus opinion when we're working with populations that are not having the severe outcomes that we're seeing for the over 60 year old population. So really, again, um, but finding the time to um, provide the most research informed and evidence-based 
public health policies, I think is critically important, especially um, when um, facing decisions around pediatric vaccinations. Um, that being said, from a public health perspective, there are significant benefits to the pediatric COVID-19 vaccine. Um, I already aired my bias. I vaccinated both of my children um, to decrease their risk of having a COVID-19 infection. We've been really fortunate is during the Omicron surge, although they probably are the most tested students in the Marine Public Schools, they never tested positive for COVID-19, although they did miss school for other, um, other reasons, other viruses that were circulating. And they didn't have to, they had a, a delay in two years of immune development as um, children, the benefit, one of the benefits of masking and other policies at the schools is look, a lot of kids weren't exposed to the run of the mill viruses and bacteria, but when they did take the mask off and we did relax those policies, we saw some of our kids not have the same more robust immune systems like they normally do. Um, there's early evidence that the vaccine itself reduces the risk of long COVID even in the pediatric population. When we're able to vaccinate and you saw that one case rate of the zero to four population, it's our up to now it is our highest case rate by age group because it's an unvaccinated population. Um, it's, a, it's a strategy to decrease community transmission and overall to reduce that probability of new variants like I discussed earlier. Um, being vaccinated decreases disruptions to school and social activities. And then most importantly, one of the reasons that really drove my decision to vaccinate my children is de decreasing the risk of exposing people at, at higher risk for severe COVID-19 outcomes. Um, like many parents in the community, my parents take care of my kids and are, are awesome babysitters or grandparents slash babysitters. And so it's always been a priority for me to making sure that I reduce the risk of exposure of my parents um, when my kids were in school and had a higher risk for COVID-19 exposure. Um, and so I think that's my last slide. And this is just a great shot. Um, I think when I have any rough days and it's been a long two, two years on managing COVID, um, this is a not a shot of my family, but it's a shot from our own um, TAM, one of the trails on TAM. And just really to thank everyone attending this call. We are, have done so well because of everyone um, committing to their um, protective practices for themselves and their families, um, for getting vaccinated. And just when you're having a stressful day, just go for a, a hike or a walk. We have some amazing resources in our community. I'll stop right there. Thank you so much, Dr. Santora. Okay, next up we have Kathy Taylor. And again, Kathy is the president of the Ouchless ER Project, which you're gonna learn a little bit about. Hey everyone, bear with me as I get this going. Great. So, hi, my name is Kathy Taylor, and as Jen said, I am the president of the Alchicer Project. But most importantly, I'm a mom. Um, I and we want to take a little bit of a moment with uh, in this webinar to kind of teach parents how to empower you. Um, what you don't realize is. The, your role in taking your children for vaccinations, which you may not realize, but by the time your child enters kindergarten, they get 30 shots up to. And now with the COVID vaccine, whether it's a two or a three series shot, these are great opportunities for parents to practice their skills on supporting their child or helping their children, trying to figure out how your child, children cope with stress. Um, nobody knows a, a child better than you. And so how do we tie this into emergency care? Well, one day you're gonna be on your way to an ER with a sick or injured child. And all the skills that you've practiced during these vaccinations are gonna be needed. It's gonna be very stressful. And just today, 80,000 children in the US will require a trip to an emergency department. And 90% of these pediatric emergencies um, are treated at community hospitals. So only 10% of pediatric emergencies make it to a freestanding pediatric hospital. Now, how does this tie in to, to me? Now, in 2015, January, I was working at UCSF and worked the day when we had the ambulances lined up on Parnassus and all our little pediatric patients got in them and were taken off to the new brand new Benioff Children's Hospital. It was a great day for us, but it was also the same month I found myself riding in the back of an ambulance with my three-year-old after midnight after a bad case of croup and he passed out and I was on my way to a hospital that I was unfamiliar with um, and had 
never planned on really using the ER because I would always go to my fancy children's hospital. But what I learned that night was that you can't tell an ambulance to go over a bridge. And then every day that I had been driving over the bridge to go to UCSF, my greatest treasure was, in, was here in Marin County and I wanted to improve the care here. And when I got to that ER, the care and experience left me feeling pretty angry and wondering how we could do better for our children. So I started researching and found that a handful of hospitals had technically decided they were quote unquote, ouchless ERs. And I didn't really know what that meant. Um, so when I researched it, I kind of just learned that ouchless care is a style of, of medicine that we practice at Benioff. And it just aims at making the medical procedures as painless and anxiety free as possible for their patients. And actually the picture here is my son um, about a year before our experience in Marin uh, Health ER. But here we are at a children's hospital in Orlando after he split his chin open at Disney World and through good support and iPad and we use lidocaine gel, he allowed us to do five stitches in his chin with no sedation, um, trusted us and we are off back to Disney World having a great time. So what, what does Outchus Care entail? It's a family style type of care. Everyone's involved. Parents are allowed to support their children. It meets the physical and emotional needs of the patient. It uses tools and techniques to, pay, to minimize pain and anxiety, the child life specialist techniques, distraction tools, um, and it introduces a new types of pediatric anesthesia and sedation that are going to allow for greater success when um, attempting procedures on the child. So rather than five, six attempts to get an IV in, that would be in one to two attempts. So what have we done at Marin General? So originally there was a pediatric physician coordinator and a 24 seven in-house pediatric hospitalist that overlooked LND in the ER. But now there's three new full-time positions. We have a pediatric nurse coordinator, a dedicated emergency department educator and Marin's first child life specialist. And the Schultz Foundation back in 2016 donated $30,000 so 120 staff could undergo the training on the new Auschwitz equipment and Benioff's child life specialist came in and gave some training to the, all the staff. And in November 2016, Marin Health was able to declare their emergency room Auschwitz. They adapted the Busy Bee, J-Tip Needles Injector, brought in an atomizer so they could make intranasal fentanyl so kids didn't have to receive a shot. And every year, donor funds have actually covered the cost of the supplies and the pediatric education program. They also, Marin Health went one step higher. They became an advanced pediatric receiving center and in 2018 received the prestigious uh, Latern Award. So how does vaccines all tie into this and your trip to the ER? Well, like I said, the vaccinations are a great opportunity for you to learn what techniques help your child. So we wanna teach you to, to pack that bag. What's in your bag, right? So what do we medical professionals use when it comes to our children? So obviously there's an iPad. Um, we can, you can pack your iPad with anything and always take that with you when you're going. Does your child need a lovey? Candy, candy is a big one for my child. When it came for vaccinations, starting at the age of two, Aiden was let loose down a candy aisle and he could choose anything anything and mommy wouldn't say no. But the kicker was he couldn't eat it until he bumped up on that bed for the shot. So he learned that he was so excited about getting the candy that every time he went for a vaccination, all he looked forward to was getting the candy, not worried about the shot. We didn't have that week of anxiety talking, mommy, is this doctor's appointment gonna have a shot? Um, and actually the trick just worked recently for us again, we did our first flight for ski week um, to the East Coast and he had a panic attack. He hadn't been on a flight in two years um, and it was a long flight for him. So before getting on a flight again, I did the trip to the candy store and he was packed with things that he knew if he sucked on that candy, it would soothe him and he could get through the feelings. Um, other things, use bubble guns. Unfortunately, now in ERs, everyone's wearing masks, so blowing bubbles gets a little limited. So if you're going to go to these vaccinations, 
bring a little bubble gun. Or if your son or daughter have a little toy that vibrates, have it ready to go. So just right before they get that shot, it's in their hand, the opposite hand and distracting them. Your phone's always a good backup. And there's so many techniques you can use with breathing. Breathing, practice breathing. Um, Chandra's gonna go deeper into that next. So what we wanted to send you with away with right now is um, just to prepare your child according to age. And you're gonna have a wonderful talk by Chandra in just a few minutes that will cover each age range. Remember your attitude plays a huge role in how your child is feeling. Get ready to distract, give your child something to do and speed. Help the medical assistant or whoever's giving the shot Handle everything with your child and they can step in and do it quickly. And then reward, go off and celebrate. Your child has made a milestone. Always keep things positive. And what is all this trying to avoid? Well, we're trying to avoid needle fear. And honestly, there's 50 to 60% of kids suffer from needle fear. And we think it starts around the age of five and it generally comes from one bad experience. And now this can develop more seriously into a fear of needles, which arises around the age of 11, kind of around the age they think around seventh graders go back for a few more vaccinations. Um, and these patients who suffer from needle phobia have real physical symptoms. Their palms get sweaty, they can even faint. So you wanna work on this. And it was really interesting. I've come across patients with needle phobia um, one, I will never forget a 70 year old man who delayed care because he didn't want to see his physician with some symptoms and he was with us at UC as an oncology patient now. Um, and then my own dentist just recently did a funny technique on my mouth when he was putting a cap in and I said, hey, you used an outchless technique. And he backed away, put his head down and just said, I have a fear of needles. And I said, well, what's your story? Because everybody has a story. And it was his pediatrician used to draw a, bull, a bullseye on his arm and run across the room thinking it was funny and get him to laugh and then give him his vaccination. And the poor guy has never re recovered. He's in his fifties. So how do we get just to no fear, no tears and no fears? It's gonna be through educating you, the parents and teaching you to acknowledge how your kid is feeling. Don't minimize it. It will be a poke, but they can get through it. It's very short. Have a plan before you go and always reward. So quickly, we just wanted to tell you a little bit about what is up next at Marin Health. Um, and there's some really great news came out recently that the Marin Health Foundation is gonna dedicate this year's gala um, to pediatric emergency. It's the first time we've had a gala in three years, but all the funds raised will go towards pediatric emergencies. and. The other really cool thing is we have this brand new fantastic ER, but it needs some decoration. Um, we always had planned on doing some pediatric rooms. And so it's time now that the COVID numbers are low that we have an idea of working with some local high school art teachers and finding the youth artists in Marin to come up with ideas of what those rooms could look like to help the children. And lastly, we want to inspire other communities to improve for their children. The, the treatment a child receives during a time they need love and support the most should not be dependent on where the emergency occurs. All hospitals should be taking care of children. And lastly, I'll end with this, my favorite quote, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than that in which it, the, oh, soul than the way in which it treats its children. Nelson Mandela, May, 1995. I truly believe Marin lives by this. And we saw it with COVID and how many of us have been responsible. And I'm just so grateful for you all that I can raise my son here. And, and I wanted to say something quickly because Lisa has said a little bit about it was why my husband and I vaccinated our son. My husband is a trained physician and, you know, we were, it would, we made the informed decision to vaccinate eight in one. We didn't want him to get COVID. And if he did get COVID, the viral load is a lot less and we're more worried about long long term covid we just don't know and our patients that we see in the hospital there is a large portion of this community that cannot vaccinate 
um, that would like to. And a lot of those were our inpatients during this last surge. And, you know, it just, it takes us all as a community to get through this. So thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you so much, Kathy, for sharing those tips. And we're gonna go ahead and ask Chandra to now share her screen. And uh, we will have time for questions and answers after this, um, after Chandra's presentation. So just wanted to let you know that. And Chandra, you can go ahead and turn your camera back on and we will, excellent. Hi everybody, my name is Chandra and I'll keep this brief because I know many of you have some great questions that you're hoping to have answered. So on a similar note to Kathy, uh, my role is really to help give you guys some practical tips that you can use to support your children when they get a vaccination or an immunization or it really translates to any sort of medical experience. I wanted to start off by sharing a little bit more about my role as a child life specialist. So for those who may be unfamiliar with child life or maybe don't know a child life specialist, my role is really focused on helping children cope in the hospital setting. So child life specialists are ed educated and trained to help in decreasing a child's experience of stress. So many of us work in the hospital setting, but there are other settings that child life specialists work as well. So we work in partnership with families and the healthcare team and of course the children, the patients to really focus on their psychosocial and emotional and developmental needs when they're in the hospital. And so a lot of what we do is incorporating play into the hospital to really prepare them for procedures and different experiences, teaching them about what's happening to reduce fear, anxiety, and pain. And so using what I know in my work, I wanted to focus on different age groups and give you guys some tips. So this is a quote from Fred Rogers that I love that really highlights the importance of play because that's how children communicate and experience the world around them. So it really is the language of children and the main tool that I use when working with children. So just something to think about when you are preparing your own children for any sort of medical experience, just the importance of play. So to start with infants, um, infants are in the sensory motor stage of development, which means that they experience the world through senses and movement. So when thinking about infants in you know, the medical environment, getting a vaccination, thinking about how we can engage their senses to provide diversion or distraction. They're learning to trust caregivers and there's in this stage, separation and stranger anxiety may start to develop. So when thinking about positioning, you know, they may be vulnerable sitting by themselves or laying alone on the bed. So how can we have the caregiver with them providing a supporting touch or holding them to really help them cope with their vaccination? So some other tips, um, as I mentioned, holding, patting, speaking in a soft and soothing voice, musical toys, rattles, light up toys, um, and also really thinking about your own anxiety level as a parent or a caregiver, because children really pick up on our cues. And this is true for any stage of development, not just infants. But if you are you know, presenting in a relaxed and calm way, then your child will follow suit and feel more calm as well. So toddlers, when thinking about children between one to three, some developmental milestones of this age, symbolic thought starts to emerge, pretend play, so thinking about how you can incorporate that as well, you know, something I use often with this age group is bringing in a pretend doctor's kit so they can kind of work through and play out some of their thoughts. I'm encouraging, you know, choices when possible. So when thinking about a vaccination, letting them choose which arm, if that is a choice, or would you rather, you know, look at this book or listen to a song, you know, a pride, a providing choices when appropriate to help them really gain that sense of independence and personal control, which is really important in this stage of development as well. Preschoolers um, around the, between the ages of three and five, that imaginative and magical thinking is, you know, really developing during this age. So they, they do have a fear of the unknown and part of their development is egocentrism, which really means that they're unable to view the world from another person's perspective. So everything is about them and happens to them, which when thinking about medical experiences, 
we often see that children in, in this stage of development may think that they did something wrong to cause an illness or injury or medical procedure. So they may think that they're getting the vaccine or an immunization because they were bad. And so I always tell families, you know, please help us assure your child that you know, the immunization is not a punishment, that this is to keep your body healthy. Some other tips for this age, again, a lot of these are similar, you know, different diversions. So music, look and find books, bubbles are great as Kathy mentioned. Again, providing choices and providing explanations. School age development, so thinking about children between the ages of six and 12, they're really beginning to understand logic and reasoning. So this is really the stage of development when they can really begin to understand why, you know, why they need a vaccination or, or why, you know, they need this certain procedure when thinking about the hospital. School and peer relationships become really important during this stage, and we start to see children become less egocentric at this stage of development and begin to think more about the perspective of others. So during this stage of development, children often ask a lot of questions or wanna know more information. So your children may ask you how the vaccine works or you know, more in-depth questions, which I encourage you to provide um, to allow their active participation helping them think about coping strategies. So really allowing them to be involved in what they think might work or be helpful when thinking about a vaccination. I spy books, you know, as Kathy mentioned, phones are great, tablets, um, squeezing a ball, taking deep breaths, all really helpful things to engage. And I do wanna mention in general, when thinking about distraction, it should never be used to trick or you know, a sneak attack for a child because again, we're trying to really build trust in the healthcare team, but rather just helping them focus on a stimulation or a sensation that's more pleasant than the vaccination or the poke itself. For adolescents, abstract thought and hypothetical reasoning begins to emerge. So adolescents begin thinking more about moral and philosophical and ethical and social and political issues. So they seek to be accepted by others. So when thinking about the healthcare environment, they may gain more influence from their peers than their parent or a caregiver. Privacy can be important. Um, so I think, you know, helpful tips as far as, you know, with the COVID vaccine, if they're getting a shot in their arm, helping remind them to wear a short sleeve shirt so they don't have to, you know, take off their sweater and be exposed, you know, just to provide them some, with some more privacy giving them honest explanations and providing them with some other, you know, tangible things. Maybe that's just talking about their favorite activity or place or putting on some music, but allowing them to provide, be involved in their coping strategies. So pain management. There are many different pain management options out there. You know, when thinking about here at Marin Health, we have all of these available and some that I forgot to put on there, but even in your own pediatrician's office or your clinic, ask them what options are available. Some of these, you know, you can even purchase, you know, Buzzy can show you here. Buzzy, it's a little bit blurry, but he works off of the gate control theory. So he actually vibrates and you can see in the bottom picture on the right, you put it between the pain and the brain. And so it's a way for your child to focus on the sensation of the vibration more and the feeling of the poke a little bit less. The shot blocker, which you see in the other top picture works similarly. And there's numbing creams, there's numerous things available that I encourage you to ask your provider what's available again to just help minimize any pain experience. Preparation is really important when thinking about preparing for any sort of medical experience, but especially a vaccine. So typically the older your child is, the further in advance they should be prepared. Help them with creating a coping plan. So asking them, what, what do you think might help you hold still? Um, obviously depending on the age of your child, of course. I always tell families that it is a typical reaction for children to cry or become upset when hearing information, but that we still should be preparing them for it. Again, it helps them work through their, their feelings. It helps us validate their feelings and then focusing on what they have a choice in, right? They're allowed to be upset about this, but together let's find a way to make this as easy as possible and use their strengths. You know, maybe they're more of a visual learner and would benefit from seeing pictures. There's a lot of great videos and books out there to prepare for the COVID vaccine specifically or any immunization or healthcare experience. 
Um, Kathy mentioned this, but a lot of children respond well, well to incentives. So maybe having something fun to look forward to after can be really helpful as well. Additional coping strategies, because we know this can be really hard for children, but also for you as caregivers as well. Um, these are some tips to help them cope. So being honest, um, being honest about what's gonna be happening Comfort positioning, which in the next slide, I'll quickly show you some different ways to position, but it's basically a way so you can still be touching and loving on your child that helps them feel more comfortable and calm. Bringing a comfort item if you have time to prepare, so if there's a stuffed animal or a blanket that your child responds well to, lowering your own parental anxiety, thinking about diversion, so bubbles or singing, I spy games, your phone, Appropriate choices, you know, which arm for the vaccine would they like to count before the poke, maybe choosing a fun Band-Aid, and then focusing on something fun afterwards. So these are some examples of what I call comfort positioning, which is a secure hugging hold to help your child feel safe and secure during a medical procedure or vaccination. So for an infant, you can swaddle them. If they're breastfeeding, that's also a great um, pain management tool, you know, back to chest. As you can see, you can kind of scan through here. Um, all of these allow them to be in the lap of their caregiver or loved one. Um, that's the biggest support to them. And it also is a disguise as, as a hold without a stranger having to hold them down as well. And then just quickly, I wanted to mention children who have developmental differences or exceptionalities. You know, you as the caregiver and parent know your child best and you are their best advocate. So use their strengths to tailor preparation for their needs advocate for alternatives and accommodations. So for any child, you know, it can be important if there's specific things that your child may benefit from. You know, you can call the clinic ahead, share a coping plan or your child's strengths with the provider. I've helped many families create a coping card that they keep, the parent keeps in their wallet. So it's something they can show the provider without having to repeat and retell what's helpful. There are a lot of great websites out there, again, as I mentioned, that have wonderful tools to prepare um, if your child is on the autism spectrum, autism speak ha autismspeaks.org has great resources specific to blood draws and immunizations, which can be a wonderful resource. So feel free to take my email. I know I went through that pretty quick. So to give you guys time for questions, um, I'm happy to answer any questions specifically to, to my email as well. Thank you so much, Chandra. And yeah. I'd like to ask all the panelists now to go ahead and turn your cameras on. And Chandra, you could stop sharing your screen. I want to let folks know that we have recorded this webinar. And so we will be able to post that along with the slide decks. So, OK, so now let's um, we're going to spotlight everybody. So uh, we've had a number of questions come in. Uh, let's see. Oops, let's. Okay, so we've had a number of questions come in. Um, so first of all, I think that a couple of these are gonna be for Dr. Santora. So first of all, um, uh, a woman writes, that she's got a daughter that's gonna be turning five in May and she wants to get her vaccinated against COVID and is anxious about the upcoming B2 wave. Um, as she understands the variant is highly contagious and they're so close to her fifth birthday, she wonders if it isn't possible to start the series now. And she says she understands it's based on the immune system maturity, but will one month really matter? We've avoided COVID for two years. I'll be livid if she gets it now. Um, they're taking precautions, but she's in preschool and there's only so much that they can control. So they'd love any feedback on this and why they can't start the Pfizer series now. We in public health cannot um, provide a vaccine until the child reaches five years because it would be an off-label use. And in public health, we are a, a mass vaccination um, clinic style. So um, that may be different than a, a private provider, but there's also a difference in, in doses. Um, so I think that's why your private provider might also tell you the same thing I'm saying is to wait. I know you're concerned and you you're almost there and a happy birthday to your daughter and um, it'll be a great birthday gift. But um, at this time, we would not recommend vaccination until she turns five years old. Okay, when do you anticipate vaccine approval for kids under five? Um, saw some positive results from the Moderna study, but it's been a while since then. And then a follow-up, will a booster be approved for ages five to 11? And if so, what's the timing? 
So this is the reading tea leaf part. We think the under five will approve in June. And that's a fresh, like I mentioned, that's a frustrating um, part for us because we think the Moderna vaccine is ready for approval based on the preliminary studies that have been shared. And we think that this is a consideration that um, Pfizer has been played a key role in, in vaccinating children. But again, that's tea leaf reading. So we think that the under five will come in June. The booster for the five and above, we were expecting that to come sooner. Uh, and we were actually expecting an announcement um, before the end of this month. Uh, that being said, the, the rumor mill that started churning last week has quieted up. And that's sadly, and this is again a frustrating part, which I think um, again increases distrust about something important is there's not what you would think that, you know, the federal government um, provides clear notification to the CDC, who then communicates with the states on clear timelines. That is not what has happened at, at any point during this pandemic. So, um, but all of our five to 11 year olds, including mine are, are on the verge, um, especially in a community like Marin that were early adopters of pediatric vaccines. Many of them are on the verge of, the, um, of that booster dose timing. Uh, that being said, with the BA2 variant and now BA3, um, we're starting to see a, another variant starting to circulate. Um, again, it's just a descendant, um, a, a contagious descendant of, of, of the Omicron variant itself. Um, we, we feel confident because it is not as virulent that even if there's a delay in the booster approval that our pediatric population is, is, um, is safe. And just a clarifying question, is the June ETA for ages six years to 12 years or ages six months to 12 years? Uh, we believe it'll be for the Moderna for six months to 12 years, and then for the Pfizer for six months to four years, 11 months and 29 days. <laughs> okay. Um, and does the data on pediatric Moderna vaccine worldwide show any benefit over the Pfizer vaccine at this time? Looking at sort at, of the over five. At this time, no. And that's one of, that's one of the challenges is that we haven't had those head-to-head -head trials that we would like to see. There were some early indications that Moderna for adults was out performing Pfizer. And, um, and you might have remember that Johnson & Johnson, um, the Janssen was very out of favor. But we've consistently seen when you're looking at the outcomes of hospitalizations and severe disease um, that they, they all have performed relatively equally, all, all three of those vaccines, although the CDC has a different booster recommendation for the, for the, the Janssen or Johnson & Johnson vaccine. What are the risks of long COVID in the pediatric population? This is a really hard part of being in a pandemic with a novel virus that we don't know a lot about. And we, um, we, one, it's hard for us to identify long COVID in the um, pediatric population, just for, um, from our previous pre presenters describing the behavioral and developmental differences of our, our youngest population. It's very hard for them to articulate um, some of the symptoms that you and I might be able to articulate, you know, um, headaches or achy bones or numbness and tingling and neuro some of the neurological sides long COVID symptoms, it's harder in that pediatric population. So I think there'll um, be challenges even in the identification and diagnosis of long COVID in the pediatric population. And this virus is just different. If you talk to anyone that's been infected, like most of us, when we've recovered from the flu, it, you feel like wiped out for a week or two, or maybe a little bit longer, but then you typically, the majority of people would say that they recover to their, their previous the way they used to be. Um, with COVID, it's different. We're hearing people have neurolo neurological findings months out, um, muscle ske musculoskeletal findings months out, and we still are just learning a lot about long COVID. And I think that, again, is one of, especially when there's neurological considerations in the pediatric population, that's what gets our doctors' um, ears kind of warm um, and, and considering long COVID. And again, considering another benefit of vaccination, especially in that younger population where you have such rapid neurological development during um, a critical point of their life. So, and I think, and I appreciate the frustration because it's just not the research that we want, we want to have. That being said, we're preparing to launch um, one of our strengths in Marin County is just having a local epidemiology team. And we're preparing to launch our own study on long COVID in Marin County residents of all ages who've been um, infected with COVID-19. So if you've been infected with COVID-19, don't be surprised 
if you receive a, a questionnaire um, trying to learn more about your, your long COVID symptoms. And we are including, um, it's a, it'll be in Spanish and English, and we also will be um, having a survey for, for the pediatric population too. Excellent. So were there any children hospitalized this year because of COVID, not with COVID, but because of COVID that did not have RSV, flu, or some other virus that might contribute to them being hospitalized? This is, we have had very few hospitalizations for during the Omicron um, wave for the pediatric population. It's um, less than what is reportable. Um, so our, our 10 is at what is our reportable number. And so it's been less than 10. The reason why we can't release any more than the less than 10 is just because it becomes um, personally identifiable because we're a really small community and everyone knows, <laughs> knows somebody. Um, so it's been less than 10 and we did not see a significant um, number of our, of our pediatric population hospitalized for Omicron. And again, we're a very cocooned um, community. And that's one of the benefits. I think um, what you've heard even from the first question is that parents have really taken it seriously um, especially parents that haven't had their kids um, between zero and four vaccinated really have implemented protective measures, you know, to the detriment of some of the social development of our kids um, and, and have cocooned their family. Everyone who can be vaccinated has been vaccinated. And I think that's been very protective. But I think that's where some of our community now is frustrated as we're seeing these upticks in cases again, that you would hope that we were so vaccinated that we, um, that we wouldn't be seeing these upticks. And that's just the reality of waning immunity. And, and where Marin County fared better than many, um, in some ways, uh, it gave us a, there's a double-edged sword. We didn't have the same amount of hybrid immunity or natural immunity because so, so many of us were protected. We had the lowest case rates of COVID-19 in the state, um, but we benefited from having very low hospitalization rates and that's, that's great, but we didn't have the same levels of natural immunity that other communities that had lower vaccination rates, so. Okay. Um, and I think we did, you did answer the question about zero to four being hospitalized under 10. So that's the answer to that. Um, another comment uh, about the vaccines being experimental and having no idea about what the vaccines will do long-term to children and that there is, um, you know, that the vaccine was supposed to stay in the deltoid muscle but uh, this person thinks it goes throughout the body and that there are reports of myocarditis, infertility, pericarditis, autoimmune disorders, et cetera. So less than 500 children have died of COVID since March, 2020. Why would we risk our children's health for something we have no idea what it will do? I think well, that's again why it's so important for families to make an informed choice. We, um, we, there's obviously a bias on, on, on the panelists here and we've shared We've, we've made an informed choice for our families and we've seen the benefits that the vaccine offers, again, from preventing infection itself, protecting against long COVID, protecting vulnerable residents in our own families and our social networks. And I, again, I think that's, there are adverse effects um, from vaccines. I think that's one of the hardest, and that's why I described earlier why even as even someone that's pro-vaccine, when I had to vaccinate my first kids and I think it was, like you said, it was like 30 vaccines before they enter kindergarten, that feels like a lot. Um, these vaccines have proven to be safe and that does in no way diminish. Um, there have been families that have experienced adverse effects of vaccines and um, that can be from traumatic um, to devastating. But again, what we've seen is that for all of the side effects that have been or adverse effects, it's greater if you have a COVID infection itself. You're more likely to have myocarditis from being infected with COVID than having myocarditis from a vaccine. And that's why we continue to see vaccine being promulgated throughout the globe um, steadily because we have seen over the past year that they are safe and effective and it is our primary tool for ending this pandemic. Excellent. It seems that some people go on to the VARES website, which is the Vaccine Adverse uh, Event Reporting System website, and they read those reports and they think that these are all adverse events associated with vaccines. Can you explain a little bit about what that database is and why people shouldn't read those and sort of freak out? Um, it, 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 anyone can report into this adverse event system. And it's, that's a wonderful thing. It is the most um, monitored vaccine that's ever been introduced into our globe because of technology, technological advancements that we've had, because of the attention that um, has been 
given to that have been raised by those who are concerned around the vaccine safety. And so anyone, doctors can report a vaccine adverse event, an individual can report a vaccine adverse event. And so it can go from um, things that we know are clearly not related to a vaccine event, a, fra a fractured bone, um, to something that could be a vaccine um, adverse event like myocarditis. And it was actually the, the system itself that found the signal of myocarditis as being a, a, an adverse event um, in that, especially in that young male population. And, but that being said, a reported adverse event does not make it a confirmed adverse event. There's then an investigation that the CDC does in partnership with local health jurisdictions like ourselves to investigate um, and confirm which events are adverse events. So it's, it's a great database, but it's not, uh, it is not a, a confirmatory database. And then what we do look at, and we have it posted on our website, we have a bibliography of all the published re research and we know if it's peer reviewed or not peer reviewed, showing um, again, the body of evidence of um, the safety and efficacy of these vaccines in our community. Okay, um, and then I think I'm gonna unmute Dr. Bedard, he had a question. Larry, if you wanted to unmute yourself. I have two questions. First, I wanted to know if you know of any vaccination sites that use therapeutic dogs. You mentioned all the things to movies and music and this and that, but I've been convinced recently, my daughter has two dogs, how effective therapeutic dogs. And if you don't know of a site, maybe we should have one at the Wind Health Medical Center. And the second question I'd ask to Dr. Santori, because I don't think you, I probably administered as an emergency physician more than 10,000 vaccinations or ordered the nurse to do it. Do you know of any vaccine that has an adverse effect five or 10 years after a person's been vaccinated? I mean, you can get a sore arm and some inflammation, et cetera, but a lot of anti-vaxxers, oh, it may make me sterile in five years or cause cancer in 10 years. Do you know, has there ever been a study that shows a single vaccine has any adverse effect a year or more after a vaccination? So, so those are two questions. Well, I'm proud to say we had um, dogs at some of our pediatric vaccine clinics. We worked with child life specialists um, and our school populations to um, our school experts just to create um, environments that um, were ouchless <laughs> environments at our vaccine clinics. Not all of them had it. Um, and we'll be, especially with the younger population, the, the under five population, which you can imagine just creates a an overwhelming sense for a public health professional. Think of how many, um, vaccinating that many children under five. Um, five to 11 was hard. <laughs> under five comes with a, a lot of different range of emotions. We'll be continuing our work with the child life specialists to create an ouchless um, environment at as many vaccine clinics as we can have. On to your second question. Well, were the dogs beneficial, do you think? Oh, yes. I think dogs absolutely, um, dogs absolutely are, benef are beneficial. They're calming. Um, they, I think there's even published research that shows the benefit of, of dogs and relaxing and distracting. A good emotional um, support dog also just distracts people um, like, like uh, Kathy and Shanda described, something that's just play and distraction to um, keep the child focused away from what's happening. So absolutely, we saw the benefit and it helps everyone. I think every, our nurses were, <laughs> our, our vaccine, our, um, our nurses were vaccinating, it decreases the stress for them. So. I uh, have a bias, a poor dog bias, obviously, too. And then onto your second question, the majority of adverse effects I'm seen from vaccines, all vaccines happen typically within the first two weeks of administering the, of the vaccine, um, and most, most and within the first week, and usually up to a month. And that's because the adverse effects that we see from vaccines are usually related to the body's immune response to the vaccine itself just like its immune response to an infection itself. So we usually see the majority of adverse effects happen within the first two weeks. And that's, for example, consistent with what we saw with um, myocarditis in, in young males who received the vaccine. And, um, and then just onto the, the nature of this mRNA vaccine, a lot of people think thought it was just a, such a new vaccine. It's really been in development for decades. Um, it was ex its development was accelerated um, but the, the way it's designed is it doesn't even stay within your body. Um, it, and I think that's some of the concern around the vaccine is that it stays in your body. 
it doesn't, it creates a code that basically is, is disintegrated your body, your body's immune response um, res responds to seeing the spike protein that's created. Um, and then, then again, it's within, within weeks, it's the immune response that stays um, and the adverse effects that would have been experienced would have been in those first um, week or two after the vaccine itself. You didn't answer the question, i.e., so you said maybe up to a month or possibly two months. Do you know any vaccine a year after it's been administered has any adverse effect or specifically not they know. fertility? Is there any? Not any they know, though. Not a de novo adverse effect a year out. Um, it would be a, there might be a residual effect. Um, for example, if there's some neurological, if there's a neurological adverse effect that was experienced within the first weeks after a vaccine, someone may still have those um, conditions months to years yeah. out. That debil a debilitating condition, but no, it's not. There's not a year out a sudden um, adverse effect from a vaccine. I think you scared right. a lot of potential patients. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Bedard. Um, we do, we just have time for one last question. We're actually over time now. Um, but one person asked if vaccines increase the probability of emergence of new variants um, and that they saw a study that, uh, that sort of indicates that. What have you heard about that? The biggest concern is having under-vaccinated parts of our globe. And what our concern in public health is in Undervaccinated, undeveloped parts of our world is where variants and variants um, that could be dangerous to our population or human population emerge. And the concern specifically around the coronavirus is it's a zoonotic um, that virus. So it, it bounces back between animal and human hosts. And so that increases the risk of, you know, of very of mutations that can become again more virulent. To a human population, so vaccine is recognized um, globally as being the primary tool for, reduce, for reducing the risk of um, mutations and variants emerging that could be dangerous to human health. That being said, there is um, studies that have emerged and just concern about overboosting and trying. And this is where we're trying to find, uh, looking at clinical research and trying to find what is the optimal boosting based on the population and different risk factors that people have. You can, in some ways, exhaust your immune system if you overboost. And so there is some early research that emerged as early as 2020 that um, saw that there could be not necessarily the emergence of, um, of new variants itself, but just decreased effectiveness of a vaccine. So I think that's where the challenge, um, if many people remember in healthcare, you used to only get started with only one shot of hepatitis B, and then they realized you needed two shots of hepatitis B. And then by the time I was in medical school, it was three shots of hepatitis B. That's where it takes time. It takes you know, controlled clinical trials really to fine tune what was what an emergency response to be, what will be the clinical standard of care moving forward. And it's just very challenging in a pandemic. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody. And again, we've gone over time. So I'm really grateful for all of your time here today. Um, if you get your children vaccinated, use some of the tips that you hopefully learned about today. We did record this and we will have it posted on our website. And uh, thank you all for attending and thank you to our wonderful panelists. Have a great night, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.